Step 4. Spherical waves. Imagine a very still lake and you drop a stone in that lake. So at the point where the stone hits the lake, we can set our um, uh, uh, origin of our coordinate system. And as the stone hits the water, then we all know what happens. It produces a nice circular or a ring-shaped wave that just propagate outwards. So at uh, time t0, it hits the surface of the water. At time t1, the ring will have a certain radius. At time t2, the radius will increase. Now, spherical waves are very similar to this. It's just that they are in three dimensions, and therefore the ring is uh, not just two-dimensional, but it's a nice sphere. And that's the sort of waves that we're going to be talking about in, in this step. And uh, these spherical waves are ideal in the sense that they propagate only ra um, radially outwards and they're uniform on the surface of the sphere, but they're actually very useful in practical applications as well. So you could imagine that uh, you have a source um, of, uh, let's say, sound waves, so um, in, inside some fluid that's uh, producing these idealized spherical waves that then propagate away from the source. Or you could consider an idealized point source of light. That means some source that is producing electromagnetic waves, like a little, little antenna. Uh, because uh, we are going to deal with a spherical symmetry, it's nice to talk about spherical coordinates before we actually start deriving any, um, any mathematical uh, expressions. So just to remind you what spherical coordinates are all about, here I'm, uh, uh, we are writing the usual Cartesian x, y, and z coordinates. And to transform uh, um, these coordinates into spherical coordinates, we can use the following rules. So let's say that we have some point P with uh, coordinates x, y, and z. In spherical coordinates, we're going, to trans uh, we're going to write it in terms of coordinates r, theta, and phi. R is the radius or the distance uh, of uh, the point P away from the origin of our Cartesian coordinate. Theta is the angle um, that um, this uh, vector R uh, is making with the uh, z-axis. And uh, phi is the angle um, between the projection of vector R onto the xy plane and the x-axis. So, the most easiest coordinate to remember or derive is the z-coordinates in Cartesian coordinates corresponds to r times cos theta, as you can see from here. All we do is we just project the value of r onto the z-axis. To obtain the x and y uh, Cartesian coordinates, we have to first project the, the vector r that's pointing to point p onto the xy plane, and then if we are interested in the x-coordinate, we take the uh, cosine of uh, phi, or if we are interested in the y-coordinate, we take the sine of phi. And uh, the ranges for these, uh, um, for these uh, coordinates are now not minus uh, and plus infinity like they are for the Cartesian coordinates, r is always equal to, um, is never negative, it's always zero or larger. So it goes from zero to positive infinity. The angle uh, theta is uh, between zero and pi, and the angle phi goes all the way uh, around the xy plane, so it's between zero and two pi. So let's now consider an idealized point source of light. Um, it is, uh, when it, we say it's idealized, what we mean is that the radiation is emitted uniformly in all directions. So there is no preference uh, in terms of direction in which the point source is emitting. And these um, uh, waves that are produced are propagating radially away from the source. Such a source is also called isotropic. So really what happens is that um, if we put our uh, idealized uh, isotropic point source at the center of our Cartesian coordinate system, then uh, the waves that are produced are basically concentric spheres increasing in diameter. So now we are finally ready to answer the question how to describe spherical waves. We said that um, we are looking for some wave function that uh, is written in terms of this uh, uh, coordinates. The spatial coordinates are r, theta, and 5 in spherical coordinates, and we have the same time coordinate as before. 
So, also there is one nice simplification for spherical, uh, um, spherical waves uh, produced by isotropic idealized source in that we can make use of spherical symmetry, meaning um, that the wave function will only depend on how far away it is from the origin, so it will only depend on R. As we said, an isotropic source uh, producing waves, make sure that the waves are propagating uh, um, radially outwards and there is no preferred direction. So there is no dependence on theta and phi coordinates. So the question now is, what is the wave equation in spherical coordinates? In particular, what is this uh, uh, Laplacian operator in spherical coordinates? Well, we're not going to derive the full uh, expression because the full expression looks something like this. It's rather daunting. But just to give you an idea how such an expression can be obtained, we are going to derive just the radial part given by this first term over here. Because these other terms will be zero anyway, since we are um, dealing with spherical symmetry of the system. So let's derive the spherically symmetric Laplacian. What we are looking for is a way to transform uh, Laplacian and Cartesian coordinates into this expression right here that only depends on the radial coordinate. So we're only going to do it for this first term because then the other terms can be done in a very similar way. And you will see that even for the first term, it's quite a, a challenging and tedious task. But let's, let's go through it. So we start with um, a partial derivative of our wave function with respect to the Cartesian coordinates x. We apply the, apply the chain rule and we obtain the following expression. From that, uh, we can get uh, dr by dx, just using the normal transformation of Cartesian coordinates into spherical coordinates. Next, what we're looking for is we want this expression right here. So we want this second order uh, partial derivative with respect to x. So we take our expression that we derived here and we uh, differentiate it with respect to x again. And again, applying chain rule over and over again, and the product rule, finally what we get is the following expression. So here, this part right here can be calculated quite easily. This part we don't have to touch because it's a partial derivative with respect to r, which is what we are looking for. So really what we need is just this guy right here, the second order partial derivative of r with respect to x. So we can use the following uh, identity that r squared is just the sum of the Cartesian coordinates squared, x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And for that, we can immediately derive that dr by dx is just x over r, which we substitute back in and we get the following expression for the second order partial derivative of r with respect to x. Again, simplifying, we get the following and we finally obtain this expression. Now, we can do the exact same thing for a second order partial derivative with respect to y and with respect to z. And what we get is this expression. Oh, sorry, this is still for x. And similarly for y and z. So let's, let's look at uh, what we have here. Here we've got x squared over r squared. When we do the partial derivatives with respect to y, in this place we will have y squared over r squared, similar for z, z squared over r squared. So when we add all of the partial derivatives together with respect to x, y, and z, in fact, we will have x squared plus y squared plus z squared over r squared. So we will see that this fraction right here, that's just going to be one. So all that we're gonna be left with is this following expression. And a similar thing will apply for the second term right there. So we can finally write that um, the Laplacian operator in spherical coordinates, where we are taking into account the spherical symmetry, has the following form. But we're actually not going to be using this form. We can rewrite it slightly differently as uh, what you see right here. So it's one over r squared, a derivative with respect to r of this entire expression right here. So we obtained our expression for our Laplacian when we are taking into account spherical symmetry. And it's the following. So we can write down our wave equation. So 
Notice here that on this side, we are taking the partial derivative with, uh, with respect to r of r times um, psi, our wave function. Whereas on the right-hand side, it's just the usual expression. We are taking the uh, partial time derivative with respect, uh, uh, with respect to time of our wave function psi. So we can use a very simple trick now. We multiply both sides by r, and we obtain the following expression. And you see that this is nothing but our usual uh, wave equation in one dimension, where now we are looking for solutions that are not uh, solutions psi, but solutions r times psi. But we know how to solve um, simple one-dimensional wave equations. We saw that the solutions are given in this form. We've got some function f, where the argument is r minus plus v over t, minus for waves traveling in one direction, uh, along k, or away from the source, and plus uh, waves traveling in the opposite direction. But other than that, we're not assuming anything about this functional form of um, uh, uh, the function f giving us uh, the wave function. So, the general solution can be written like that. Our spherical uh, waves, our general spherical waves, are given by this function here, but rescaled by r. And that comes from the spherical symmetry. So, we can take the superposition of two such solutions, one traveling in one direction, the other one, so away from the source, that's given by this uh, term proportional to c1, and the term proportional to C2 is given by a different uh, form, and that's traveling towards the source. So let's just uh, uh, consider a particular example, and again we're going to go back to our harmonic uh, spherical waves. So we derive that the harmonic spherical waves have the following form. It's the usual uh, A times sine kr minus omega t, but now rescaled by r. So let's see what's the effect of that rescaling. So we see that as the wave propagates, the actual uh, shape of the wave is changing. And this A, that's basically given, uh, that's called the source strength. So at the origin, that's um, the amplitude of the wave. But as it goes away, the amplitude is being rescaled. As it travels away from the source, the amplitude is being rescaled by R. Yes, so that's uh, what we said. And here's, here's, here's an example of what it looks like. So if we consider the change of our wave function psi as a function uh, of r, increasing r, we have the following shape. We've got these nice harmonic sinusoidal oscillations, but their amplitude is being rescaled by this uh, factor of 1 over r. So if we propagate it in, in forwards in time, we will see the following, um, following um, waves. So imagine that now we're just taking a slide through the spherical wave. That's why, and we're looking at it from sideways. So physically, why, why do we get um, this rescaling by 1 over r? We saw that it arises mathematically from the wave equation um, and as a result of the spherical symmetry. But physically, it's because of conservation of energy. So the wave is created with some finite energy uh, at the beginning, but as the wave spreads, it's increasing in size. Therefore, the, its amplitude must uh, reduce to compensate for the spreading, and in order to preserve energy. So, to conclude our uh, final example of, um, uh, of uh, three-dimensional waves, spherical waves are waveforms traveling radially away or towards the origin. And uh, their functional form depends only on the radial coordinate, and that's because we are assuming isotropic idealized point sources. Therefore, their uh, form only depends on r, but doesn't vary with phi or theta. And the interesting part is that the shape is attenuated by a factor of 1 over r as we travel away from the source. And plane waves approximate um, spherical waves if you are far away from the uh, origin, from the source uh, of, the, of the spherical waves. And you can easily see that for circular waves. If you're standing very close to the source, then you can see that um, the waves are circular. But as the waves propagate far, far, far away, for example, you're standing somewhere here, on the, over here, then you see that the wave fronts start to uh, look more like plane waves, but only in a small, small region. And that concludes our lesson on wave examples.